Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from, but a very warm welcome, as always, to today's event. Um, on behalf of Third Bridge, I'm thrilled to welcome everybody today, um, where we'll be doing a deep dive on critical private equity trends, including need to know AI investing. Um, as some of you will remember, back in July, we published our US private equity report. Um, this looked at how senior executives within the private equity industry were planning for the year ahead. Um, Questions included fundraising, deployment, debt financing, some of the advantages of size and scale, and of course the use of technology, which is going to be the subject of much of the discussion today. Um, one of the headlines, actually, interestingly enough, that came out of the report was that despite having the widest bid-ask spread, um, tech and specifically artificial intelligence is attracting a high level of, of PE interest. I think we've all, we've all seen that. Um, and as such, a, you know, a webinar was born. Um, so over the next 45 minutes or so, um, we'll be giving you a whistle-stop tour through said report um, and also unpacking some of those trends that are impacting the private equity industry today. Um, as far as introductions go, my name is Dan Thomas. I'm a sector analyst here at Third Bridge. I'm joined, uh, joined live by Harriet Matthews, uh, funds editor at Merger Market. Hi, Dan. Thank you for having me. Thank you for hosting. And hello to everyone watching online. Uh, joined by Scott Kessler, global sector team lead for TMT here at Third Bridge. Hi, Scott. Hi, Dan. Thanks for uh, having me today. And joining us remotely, uh, Joshua Maxey, co-founder and head of corporate development here at Third Bridge. Josh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dan. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> Actually, we can just jump straight in with our questions. Um, so, Joshua, uh, Harriet, given your respective vantage points, obviously Harriet coming from uh, a background at Merger Market, having reported extensively on secular trends within the private equity industry and uh, you know LP and GP profiling. Joshua Maxey, you're obviously head of corporate development here at Thurbridge, and you speak daily with uh, senior executives at our largest private equity clients. Um, Joshua, perhaps you could just comment on some of the key takeaways, um, some of the things that stood out to you most from uh, from our report. Um, thank you, Dan, uh, and very nice to be part of this panel today. Um, I think there are a few interesting trends in the industry right now that um, I'm certainly hearing from our clients. Um, first of all, the deal pipeline is very full, um, and, and if you think about um, Apollo's May uh, earnings uh, results, they stated that their deal pipeline was 3x on the same time last year. So we, there is there's an abundance of deals, and the private equity industry is, is very busy uh, trying to find you know, s solutions to unlocking um, some or catalysts that will unlock some of these deals, and I think that's the, the, the biggest issue facing the industry right now. Um, it's not so much about the absolute interest rate, it's more about the volatility in interest rates and looking at some level of stability to where people can price risk. And that has been one of the, 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 the biggest issues uh, that the industry has. And the debt financing market has certainly gone through a very, very quiet phase. That said, um, there are certainly positive signs on the horizon. Um, we've certainly seen in August uh, a pickup in demand again from clients looking at uh, a lot of transactions, especially in the uh, software space, um, something around 70 to 80 percent of deals at the moment are related to a software angle. Of course, AI plays a big part in that, and it's an area that we'll be discussing further. Um, but that said, you know, if, if you look at the actual deals that are being uh, uh, that are closing, you know, we're at a level which is about 24 percent off of the height uh, back in 21. But that obviously was a, a high bar, so we're benchmarking against quite a high number. And we're probably in an environment where things have stabilized uh, quite a bit again. And the real, the real uh, interesting side uh, will be you know, what we're going to see now in September as we go uh, into the post-Labor Day uh, run-up towards the holiday period. And I think this is going to be the really defining moment. Um, I think one other thing I would add is that conversations with clients uh, have, have a very different perspective. And so some clients were very hopeful that post-Labor Day we would start to see uh, a lot more deal flow um, and then on the other side of the range, it was more like 2024. But that is still a, quite a narrow range, and I think that gives me some level of optimism that we should expect to see, uh, certainly in the tech space, an abundance of deals that uh, will, w we should expect to see closing between now and the holiday period. Yeah, really, really inter interesting, um, Joshua. And to, to kind of complement that, I think. Um, I wanted to give our, our viewers a bit of an update on um, what merger market data is, is showing about 
where private equity is at in terms of activity um, in the US and in, in North America as a whole. Obviously, the report was published back in July, but we've seen um, quite a few kind of large cap deals coming through them, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail perhaps later on. But just to kind of set the scene, um, year to date, uh, we've seen $181 billion worth of deal volume coming through um, in North America. That's across 575 deals. Um, that's actually down um, by around a third on 2022 in both deal count and deal volume. But we all obviously know what a record year 2021 in particular was and 2022 again. Those are kind of quite outlier years, in fact, if you look at the kind of overall trend of private equity activity. Um, we're back at levels that we've seen um, in terms of transaction volume back in 2019. So actually, you know, it, it, even with this kind of suppressed demand, we're still at quite a decent level of, or not suppressed demand actually, um, because as you said, Joshua, the, um, you know, the, there's still a lot of, of pent up demand. There is a big pipeline, but we've got a kind of, um, you know, various issues that I think the report goes into around bid ask spread, for example, which I know you probably want to say a bit more about later, Joshua. Um, but, you know, e even with that happening, activity is still at, at quite a kind of decent level if we put it in the overall context. Exits are down as well on, you know, versus 2021 and 2022, which obviously entails some problems for fundraising. But again, they're around the level that we've seen in, in 2020. So, you know, in, and I would add, actually, this is kind of fairly, it's understandable and it's fairly normal in terms of the kind of overall global M&A outlook. Where I would kind of compare and contrast is North America versus Europe. Um, Europe's been hit quite a bit harder by a number of the very well-known macro issues that we're contending with um, and actually deal, um, deal volume there, or, uh, you know, has still not reached the level that we saw in 2020. It's still down on that um, at 71 billion um, US dollars. It's down 70% since, since last year. Building on some of those, those indicators mm -hmm. you did touch on, um, Joshua, maybe one, one for you. Um, what, what are your thoughts or how are you feeling about PE deal flow going forwards? Yeah, I mean, you know, the report highlighted an interesting uh, trend, which is that, you know, the bid-ask spread is the highest in, in tech, yet the outlook that our clients have on future demand is also the strongest in tech. So I think that really underpins um, this discussion. And um, valuations certainly have been fairly uh, buoyant in the, you know, if you look at the NASDAQ, it's up 33%. The S&P is up uh, is somewhere around 16% right now, year to date. And of course, by the way, this has a, it has a very positive impact on the denominator effect, you know, when we're thinking about, you know, GP fundraisings and maybe taking a little bit of pressure out of that, 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 uh, that effect. But when you, when you look at this sort of valuation angle, I do think that, you know, in, in tech, it's been, you know, obviously widely publicized that uh, tech, the, the tech market is, is dominated by an AI theme, which is really creating a bit of a halo effect. And so the question is really is that if you take the AI piece out, um, you know, it, does that make, uh, you know, the, the, the private equity industry, uh, you know, um, more interested in, in transacting? And, and that bid ask spread obviously has to come down um, for deals to unlock. And I think this will be an interesting uh, watch out over the next uh, couple of months to see whether we are going to see some of the software deals close at a valuation that um, companies are willing to, to sell at. Um, we have seen a lot of interest in pipe deals and the market has been dominated. You know, we have a majority of deals that are being done that are take, you know, take private situations. And, um, and, and, and I would say that I think the outlook is for more of those larger deals to happen. Um, but boards, you know, are you know still not comfortable accepting accepting some of the valuations that the private equity industry is putting forward. And when you look at history, typically what happens is that by the time boards are comfortable in accepting some of those prices, the stock market has rallied and uh, the the pipe deals are off the table. So hopefully, you know, there will be an abundance of you know further pipe transactions for for private equity clients. But you know, the timing is going to be is going to be an essential part of this. Um, no, that's that's really interesting, and, and actually, again, um, thinking about our, our data, the portion in terms of deal volume that technology has been making up, um, you know, year after year, has been rising in recent years. So, um, you know, maybe thinking about five years back, it was around 23 to 25 percent of total volume in the U.S. Um, I think looking at our latest statistics for the year to date, it's around 38 percent. So um, that appetite is very much still there. Um, 
you know, in spite of this, the bid ask spread difficulties um, that you've mentioned, Joshua, there is quite a lot in, in the, the pipeline um, there as well on the tech side. Um, I've got a few examples here um, from Merger Market's recent kind of US deal pipeline that we publish. Um, we've got um, Alteryx, which is a data and analytics business, um, which does quite a lot in AI, which is obviously one of the big topics of, of today. Uh, we've also got Eagle View Technologies, sort of a deal there on, on the horizon, potentially coming to market. Um, that company provides um, kind of geographic information system software, kind of geospatial software for, for aerial, um, aerial views, um, aerial imagery. And that, if it were to transact, would potentially provide an exit for um, sponsor owners. Uh, Clear Lake Capital and Vista Equity Partners. Um, Clearwave as well is an interesting one, um, reportedly exploring a minority stake sale. And that's another huge theme around people looking for, you know, different creative ways to, to get deals done um, and to make realizations. That company, um, backed by um, Magneta Capital, um, it's got an enterprise value of $8 billion. So obviously the minority stake won't be transacting for quite that much. It'll be a portion of that. Um, but interesting to see that there's there's clearly appetite here. Um, and on the large cap deal side, actually, um, you know, this year also isn't faring too badly in the US in terms of activity, which kind of gives gives hope um, for some of these deals coming through. Recently, we had um, the Subway deal, um, which uh, gave the company an enterprise value of, um, I think, 9.5 billion US dollars um, that was acquired by uh, Rourke Capital. We've also seen a couple of um, recent deals, even just in August, um, you know, jumping back to what you said, um, Joshua, about kind of things getting going even in the last few weeks. Um, we saw Toma Bravo uh, buying NextGen Healthcare, um, and we also saw Clayton Dubillier and Rice buying Veritiv. So the appetite is, is certainly there. With, with I would um, I would also just follow on sorry, um, Dan. Sorry, I would I would just follow on with a, with a couple of other interesting um, um, items. That, you know, observations is um, if you look at the take private market right now, um, year to date the median uh, EV has been uh, five hundred million roughly dollars. If you compare that to the same time last year, we're talking about one point seven billion. So the average value of uh, you know transactions happening has certainly uh, decreased and, and, and quite significantly. So deal flow itself, you know, being down um, is, is one part of it, but the actual, you know, transaction size has certainly come down. And, and that's one of the reasons why growth equity for the first time, I think in the last decade, is, uh, has done more deals than uh, large buyouts. And so this will be an interesting trend to watch. Harry, perhaps um, just some observations around the, the wider fundraising environment, um, how you see that developing, the fundraising environment for GPs, yeah. how easy it is to convince LPs to, you know, commit additional capital, um, anything you're seeing there? Mm, yeah, of course, um, one of my favourite topics, of course, um, so thank you, Dan. Um, I think, you know, at Joshua, you mentioned this, the denominator effect um, with public markets kind of adjusting is clearly going to be less of an issue for GPs now, which will be a relief to many. But exit activity is still relatively low, especially versus 2021 and 2022. And so sponsors need to make these exits so that they can return capital to their invest investors. And um, actually just to prove their strategy, to prove that they can make the returns they need to make in this tough market. All these questions we're kind of posing today around when activity will pick up, where it will pick up, it all kind of comes back to um, fundraising, in, in, in my view, because people need to make exits, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, so yes, I think the, the liquidity constraints on the part of LPs are going to continue. If people can't make exits, then they can't return capital to their LPs. And, and you know, the kind of cycle of, of LPs being increasingly um, kind of constrained and what they can do in terms of re-ups is, is continuing. But at the same time, there's quite an interesting dynamic in um, private equity activity and fundraising and deal structuring around co-investments. So in the large cap space, we're seeing more um, LPs, um, you know, sovereign wealth funds, for example, actually 
being increasingly interested in co-investments. Doing co-investments um, means that they can put more equity into the deals, gets over some of the financing hurdles that we've seen, so it's ideal for the GPs. And it's also good for the LPs because, um, as our viewers I'm sure will be aware, the economics around a co-investment are better for them than um, you know, having exposure to an asset um, in, in a fund. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested to see. We, we've had some massive um, fund closes, people like CBC Capital Partners raising 26 billion euros earlier this year. That, that fund targets um, Europe and North America. Um, we'll be keeping track of who's kind of coming back to market and if anyone's going to beat that target um, next year. And then, you know, the question goes back to where they're going to deploy. And um, obviously, Joshua's been giving some examples kind of around um, appetite for take privates, um, albeit with transaction sizes potentially changing slightly. Are there any other sort of, I guess, sweeteners or concessions that you see GPs making to continue to attract and retain LPs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, definitely. So in terms of actually returning capital to them, we're seeing more people engage in uh, minority stake sales. The levels of GP-led activity haven't necessarily been as high as we might have thought they would be. There's a huge amount of interest um, around doing GP-led secondaries and continuation funds. But again, valuation is a question there. You kind of, you know, you, you need to agree on a valuation and, and that the existing LPs are happy with and the new LPs are happy with when you're kind of rolling, um, rolling that over. And then there's a fair amount um, that GPs can do in terms of fund terms as well. So, um, you know, sweeteners sort of, you know, the, the typical 2820 model, 2% 2 management fee, that can come down a bit perhaps at a first close um, for the LPs that back the fund early on. And, um, you know, reaching a first close, fundraising as a whole is taking longer at the moment for um, a pretty wide universe of GPs, uh, partly due to these liquidity constraints. It's not necessarily that LPs don't want to commit they often can't, so that's something that can be kind of offered as well to, to bring them in to secure a first close, and then they can get on with deploying and proving their strategy, proving they have the deal pipeline that they've you know claimed they, they do when they're marketing their fund. I mean, with, with some of the um, obviously the deals in market that you you refer to, do you see any evidence that you know technology in particular is not going to continue to be the focus of of deal activity? It depends on the strategy, I think. So there's a, you know, a lot of value investors, people um, talking about distressed deal activity as a driver of activity. But actually, there's a lot of tech um, kind of in the pipeline in, in Europe as well. So no, I think when, when you think about the LP view, a lot of LPs, they kind of consider tech to be on a par with sustainability, kind of bordering on impact as a long-term theme. So they are trusting their GPs when they commit capital capital to them to to find the right deals in that sector um, it is it's clearly a long-term theme you know AI is is a huge theme huge theme at merger market for us in terms of kind of product development and and obviously for you um, in your research at third bridge and what your clients are asking you so um, no currently you know let's let's see the, the kind of tech bubble from 2021 I think has has gone maybe more sensible valuations but I don't I don't have the impression appetite is, is dwindling Joshua, maybe um, from some of the conversations you've been having with executives, are you getting a sense for um, you know, how, how they're thinking about artificial intelligence, whether that be the impact on their portfolio companies or actually their own sort of internal processes? Yeah, I mean, um, I think there's a there's a there's a degree of variation between clients. Um, you know, on one end of the spectrum, for example, you have firms like Blackstone who've been very vocal about their focus on AI. Um, and um, you know their, their data science team is, is over 50 people uh, large, and so you know that really shows you the commitment that they've taken to this. Um, but I would say, generally speaking, most private equity firms are looking at AI across their whole portfolio uh, set and looking at ways that they can add value. Um, you know, especially right now in this environment, um, private equity investors are are very very focused on value creation work for their for their businesses, and so. The AI theme spans across any business that has large data sets where, you know, the AI angle could be, um, you know, enhancing productivity, optimizing workflows. And so, you know, across supply chain management, um, you know, the um, legal profession, it, it, it's across all industries. So, no, I think I think private equity firms are all um, certainly my conversations with them asking me about AI, especially for our business, how we are thinking about it and how they could be also used, you know, taking advantage of, you know, AI as part of their research process. And, um, 
you know, if you think about private equity as a sort of a three-stage pronged um, sort of approach of sourcing, due diligence and portfolio management, um, the applicability of AI really spans across all of those three. And, uh, you know, summation of content as part of your due diligence process and all the uh, research that private equity firms have done themselves, you know, how, how do you extract that and how do you archive it and how you're able to retain that information in the most structured and organized way? These are big topics for a lot of our clients. With, um, I guess, with that, with that in mind, um, and given the, the topic of, the, I guess, the second half of the discussion today, um, I'd like to move on to, to Scott. Um, Scott, thank you for joining us. Um, Scott's obviously our, our head of TMT Research. He's our global sector team lead here, manages, manages the team. Um, given all of the sort of the hype, I guess, around artificial intelligence at the moment, Scott, how do you think about maybe just sizing that opportunity um, from, a, from a, just a market perspective? <coughs> Thanks, Dan. I think a lot of people um, are talking about what the opportunity consists of. Um, I've heard estimates of a trillion dollars, multi-trillion dollar type market opportunities indicated uh, for AI more broadly. Um, I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of optimism, but I would also mention that this year in particular, companies have been thinking about general IT budgets and projects. And so I think there has been somewhat of a conservatism in terms of historical challenges from an ROI perspective. Um, I saw a PwC survey not all that long ago indicating that AI could bring $17 trillion in value um, when it comes to the broader kind of global economy by 2030. So. These are clearly some big numbers. Um, they remind me of Amara's law, which is this notion that um, folks, when it comes to technology, can be perhaps overly enthusiastic over the near term and perhaps um, overly conservative over the longer term. I would submit to you that if you're thinking about a market opportunity of a trillion or multi-trillion dollars, uh, I don't think people are being conservative when it comes to the overall opportunity at this point. So I guess with that, with that in mind, if we are anticipating this AI gold rush, how, how are you maybe thinking about, or how do you think um, private equity should be thinking about assessing the p potential of, say, pick and shovel plays versus you know inv investing in specific end market artificial AI applications? Yeah, I mean, this is kind of a classic question about investing in infrastructure or investing in applications, if you will. Um, so I think that there are good arguments for both as areas of significant focus and investment. Um, I, I do think a couple of things are pretty relevant. Um, I think first is a debate that's been going on in and around AI, I think for the last couple of years, which is this notion of closed ecosystems versus open ecosystems. And the way to think about this is, the companies that have been at the forefront of AI, you know, um, I think, Harriet, you mentioned Alteryx, for example, that's a more traditional AI-oriented vendor. And those companies historically have had some challenges in terms of everything from customer acquisition uh, to the notion of how quick the sales cycles are to driving return on investment. Costs have been a significant problem that, frankly, customers and prospects have been grappling with as they think about working with these companies. So I think the pendulum, to a large extent, has been swinging away from those closed ecosystem, more traditional um, AI software vendors to more open ecosystem type players. Now, of course, the next obvious question is, OK, well, so we know who the traditional maybe more licensed cloud software players may be, right? A lot of them, some of them are publicly traded. If you think about open ecosystems, I think the best example to think of right now is, is AWS, right? The major business unit cloud operations of Amazon. And so they've, building, they've been building up an operation um, with a lot of infrastructure, <clears throat> but also a lot of interconnectivity across a lot of different areas. And so companies can partner with AWS to leverage the past substantial investments that they've made 
and also benefit from kind of their future investments going forward. I would argue that one of the best ways for small companies to get involved with and benefit from what's going on in AI is simply looking to partnerships with these giants, the companies that have made these massive investments that have platforms and frankly can build for the future. You know, I'm thinking at this point about, you know, the notion that we heard from uh, an expert when we did an interview, a forum interview earlier this year uh, related to uh, Google and its search business and how it was going to be impacted by AI. And one of the things he said is that Google had already invested hundreds of billions of dollars in AI. And this is really before they even introduced BARD. I think the implication there is that a lot of these companies have been investing massively um, for years and it provides them with a head start and frankly an advantage in a lot of respects. Any, uh, we've spoken maybe to some of the, I guess the potential winners um, as far as AI adoption goes. Anything that's come up in your research pertaining to your potential losers um, ultimately? And is this a zero sum game? How, how are you seeing it, those that may lose out as a result of you know, artificial intelligence and its widespread adoption? I think everyone is trying to look at this as winners only, and that's clearly not the way it's going to work out over time. I think there are a couple things to be mindful of. What seems most obvious is the question that I get probably more often than any other when it comes to this particular space, and that is, are people looking at AI as cost-saving exercise, a way to essentially become more productive and efficient, or are companies looking at AI as a way uh, to generate more revenue and accelerate growth prospects? I would submit to you that the answer to that question is both, right? I think in terms of maybe the near-term opportunity, the cost and expense side of the discussion probably takes priority. We've seen a number of public company executives talking about that. I think IBM comes to mind, for example. But in addition to that, in terms of the work that we've done at Third Bridge and within Forum, one of the takeaways that we've gotten is there are certain industries where I don't know if you'd call them losers, but they're industries that are focused more on the cost opportunity. So I think about ad agencies, for example. So I spoke relatively recently with uh, a global head uh, C-level executive at an ad agency. And one of the things that he said is that he could see AI enabling 30%, a third um, of costs and expenses committed to headcount to be reduced in relatively short order. Why is that? Because some of the tasks that people are undertaking at ad agencies um, can be very kind of rudimentary and repetitive. And so things like creating advertising content that's going to be surfaced on websites, for example, that's something that AI can really do and do extremely well. And so you can see these particular types of companies embracing AI in that respect. I guess the flip side of the coin is what about revenue opportunities, right? I think it's fair to say that a lot of companies see and are seizing upon those. I think about big software companies like Microsoft and Adobe. They are in the process of rolling out products that are AI enabled. I think we had an expert talk about how AI alone could add, I think, 10 to $12 billion um, in total addressable market for Adobe. He also talked about this notion that you can suddenly start charging prices that are maybe 50% above where they currently are because of the benefits of AI and the productivity gains that'll be achieved as a result. So there are definitely going to be different types of companies looking at AI differently. I think one of the other things that I wanted to mention is sometimes companies are on the right path when it comes to AI investment, and that can take a number of forms, right? You can invest in the technology, you can buy software, you can hire talent. But we have some companies, and this is relevant for this discussion, obviously, we have some companies that are acquiring AI companies in the hopes of establishing a foothold in building an AI practice. You know? And so one company that comes to mind is Real Chemistry. So Real Chemistry is a medical-oriented marketing and advertising and data and analytics firm. And they made a number of these types of acquisitions. The expert that we've talked to 
about the company within Forum, and I think we also did some work as a primer, which is one of our newer products, um, the expert essentially said they're on the right path in terms of acquiring in this area, but then they didn't kind of keep the pedal to the metal, right, and continue to invest, and he feels like they lost out on a related opportunity. To maybe, um, I guess, develop that point a little bit further, are there any um, industries or sectors where you see artificial intelligence, you know, providing particularly acute headwinds to build on your um, trade if example, your, your, your ad agencies had a, had a similar conversation actually and from a top line perspective, um, one of the specialists that we interviewed um, in the in the midterm suggested that up to 20% of creative revenues could be could be a risk. Mm -hmm. um, and you know actually AI in that sense would the advantage of AI in that sense would be conferred pretty much entirely onto the customer through lower pricing. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, they're dealing with some pretty sophisticated end customers. At the end of the day, you're talking about you know global brands. They can sort of know how much these things cost. So, is there, a, you know, from from your research, are you getting the sense that companies that are implementing these, I guess, operational improvements through AI? Do they get to keep those benefits and take those benefits to the bottom line, or do you just have to give that to the customer through more competitive pricing to stay competitive with the next guy who's decided they're going to use those, you know, those efficiency gains for, for, for price? I think it's a super important question. I don't have a great answer, but here's an example I'll provide. So we conducted an interview earlier this year focused on the call center and customer service area. And the expert essentially indicated to us that AI handles, let's say, about a third of those inquiries. So think about if you want to get in touch with you know, your bank or your cable provider or your telecoms company or what have you, about a third of those inquiries are already addressed by AI. Some people don't even realize that. In short order, that number is going to go to about three quarters. So essentially what that means is exactly what you said. So if you are a customer of a company like that, are you going to pay the same rate knowing that they're substantially reducing the amount of headcount and expenses associated with maintaining that operation? I think there's gonna be a lot more pressure on those types of companies and related pricing. It is an opportunity for no doubt, but it's something that I think increasingly folks are aware of. And it goes back to what I was saying before. The near-term opportunity is definitely related to productivity and efficiency. And we're seeing that in a number of different contexts. You know, I mentioned what Microsoft is doing with co-pilots. They're looking to charge as much for the co-pilot capability as they are for the entire office suite, right? So they're trying to extract massive benefits associated with what they have invested. It remains to be seen whether customers are gonna fall in line. To point to your experience in the industry, I'll refer to the dot com era. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to forgive me. Uh, <laughs> but um, do you see do you see analogs there with with today? Um, absolutely. It, the short answer. You know, one of the things. And look, as you alluded to, you know, I was covering technology stocks as an equity analyst in the late '90s and early 2000s, and I had um, a front row seat to what was going on. I kind of look at what's going on now is, would I say the sequel, a sequel? It seems very similar in a lot of ways. Why is that? I remember back those 25 years ago or so where companies were announcing um, initiatives and investments in kind of the internet. And I know it sounds silly almost at this point, really just to command more market attention and higher valuations. Um, I do think that there is some of that. We had some companies literally renaming themselves um, something.com just to kind of get the market benefit. Um, it seems a little silly at this point, but that actually worked to a large extent. Now, we see companies that have named themselves you know, something.ai, right? I would argue that companies that are doing similar things, announcing initiatives, announcing investments, maybe even changing their names, getting similar benefits in the market as a result. Do I think that was sustainable? No. Do I think it will be sustainable in this case? No. But I think there is one very large difference. And the large difference 
is it seems to me like 25 years ago or so, the whole market kind of got caught up in this, right? And in fact, you could look and say what was going on in terms of the dot-com bubble getting so big that it brought down the entire market. I don't know if that's going to happen in this case. Or more specifically, I don't see that happening because the scope and scale of the so-called bubble is just not comparable to what we saw 25 years ago. It's a lot more narrow. It's maybe concentrated in kind of software and maybe services within technology as opposed to across kind of industries and sectors as well. So with some of that in mind, um, you know, what should PE, I mean, we've spoken to, to equity, but um, what, what should PE investors be, you know, thinking about or particularly wary of or optimistic of, um, you know, when, when looking at the space? Yeah, I mean, so I think there are a couple things that I would keep in mind, right? So I think, and I hearken back to the discussion that we were just having, I think the investors who are most successful either were tremendously fortuitous with timing, and clearly we're not going to suggest that people just be lucky, because of course that isn't something that people can determine on their own. Nonetheless, I think what it comes down to is this notion of sticking to your core competencies, right? One of the things that we saw uh, during that dot-com bubble period is you saw style drift. Companies that were dedicated to one area deciding that they were going to invest aggressively um, in internet companies, and that might have worked for some time, but like a lot of other investors, um, that ended up hurting and hurting pretty substantially. So I think sticking to core competencies um, would be kind of the first tenet and probably should be the first tenet of you know, investment firms to start off with. I think you have to kind of consider that AI should fit within kind of the mantra or the investment thesis that a firm is going to have rather than the other way around, right? And that's kind of the way that I would think about that. Um, and then, of course, it's about due diligence. You know, how proprietary is the technology or the offerings? You know, what's the competitive landscape look like, right? And then what's going to happen in the future? Due diligence, I think, is hugely important. And so, those are the types of things that I think folks need to remember. What it comes down to is everyone likes to say it's different this time. It isn't. It really starts and ends with fundamentals and the way that you kind of understand those is through sticking to your knitting and due diligence. I think it's super interesting that you do mention style drift and, and sticking to your knitting because I think one of the key takeaways from the private equity report was that actually um, you know, PE firms would be spending much more time, taking a lot more care and attention to, to really own that skill set and really exploit their, um, you know, their experience within specific industries. I think it's, a, it's an interesting point you raise. Um, I'm keen to take the opportunity now to uh, field some of the questions that we did receive from the audience. Um, so maybe, Harriet, one for you. Um, one of the questions we did get was around legal and potentially regulatory ramifications uh, around artificial intelligence and its use within private equity. Do you see any, well, do you see anything there? Mm. Yes, so um, obviously this is all at quite an early stage, but some of it is linked to actually what you were saying, Scott. I think you identified a couple of ways businesses sometimes use AI. Um, you said sometimes um, you know, it can be to increase productivity and it can be also to um, cut costs, right? That, those, that was a kind of distinction you made. And I think the private equity approach to the use of AI at management company level, so the, the private equity firm itself, um, and at portfolio level, it will depend how they are using it. Um, if they're using it to make decisions or to, you know, to cut costs at a portfolio company level, that kind of thing, um, there will just need to be transparency and trust around that. Private equity cares about its public image. It needs pension funds, insurance companies, um, investors that do disclose that they invest in private equity to be able to trust it as a kind of a place to put their, their capital reputationally. So that's something to, to bear in mind, I think. Um, Josh might have a perspective on, on this um, as well, I think perhaps based on, on, the, on the report and on your, your knowledge of how private equity is using AI. I know the report highlighted a few things around um, use and in due diligence, um, for example. 
Absolutely. Um, private equity firms are increasingly uh, looking at ways, uh, of course, to make sure that they can abide with you know, some of the regulatory focus um, that they uh, expect to see or have seen. Um, I think the area right now that's under focus is the uh, communication between um, clients and investors. So we've seen the SEC uh, come up with revised guidance around interbroker dealer uh, and uh, their clients and the way that they communicate and how obviously AI could play a big part in this. So um, this is already the first step we've seen in, and I think everyone is expecting to see more focus by the regulator regulators on this. Now, when I, when I look at our business uh, of content and that we provide in terms of research to private equity investors, AI plays potentially a, a large part there as well. So, um, you know, if you think about it from an MNPI perspective, uh, making sure that our clients are not exposed to MNPI, that they do not receive confidential information, all of those uh, have an AI angle potentially to that. And um, if you are, um, you know, amalgamating data that is in the public domain, like a chat GPT large language model with your own data set, um, are you potentially you know, generating information that could be an hallucination and, 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 and deciding on, you know, on, on trading on that? So I think you know, some of those topics, and, and the last one is maybe a little bit more in the public equity part of the world, but I do think that um, some of those are, are a key focus area and uh, making sure that you know, clients are staying, you know, that they're protected. Harry, have you seen any um, maybe GPs or the potential for GPs to actively market the use of AI within their investment process as a means or a way to differentiate themselves from other GPs perhaps? Or do you anticipate GPs sort of communicating that to potential LPs at some point? Yeah, good, good question. Um, I think it depends what tools are available because if everyone can use these tools, um, then you know it becomes less of a kind of specialization, less marketable. But if um, if firms have their own kind of sources of data privately and they're they're using AI to kind of comb through those, then obviously that is a kind of selling point. But I mean, obviously AI is the focus of this, but this uh, this discussion. But a lot of private equity is actually very kind of human relationships based. Um, I think the report said. For example, investor relations were one of the areas where private equity is perhaps less interested in using AI versus other areas. Doesn't mean to say it can't make inroads there, but there is still quite a big human element. It's a lot about the people and the relationships. You know, do you trust the the people you're working with? Can you do the human due diligence side of, of things as well? So I think um, you know people clearly are incorporating AI into their investment processes and also into their value creation. DCs, and if people have in-house expertise on that, clearly that that will be a differentiator um, for sure. If they can have, um, you know, industry veterans, people with expertise um, who really understand AI and and understand technology and can use that for value creation, then yes, I think that that can be a differentiator when it's used kind of appropriately. Do you, um, and Dan, if I may, um, you know, one of the things that we've discovered in talking with experts about certain areas. So I think about like accounting and finance software, um, tax preparation software. Um, executives think that these are areas where you're going to see uh, corporations embrace AI for the same reasons that I talked about earlier. You can become more pro productive and efficient. And maybe it's more on the accounting side than the finance side, but the companies in this space really see tremendous opportunities, not only to kind of you know, upscale their offerings, but be a lot more profitable as they're providing them. And so I think you know, companies are already starting to do this in a variety of ways, and it's been interesting to hear repeatedly from experts about how they're doing that. I think there are, to your, to your point, I think there are puts and takes to that. It's one of those things, you know, an accounting firm, for example, can inc incorporate AI and become very, very effective at you know, preparing reporting and preparing filings. But the customer, in the same way, they can be equally empowered by an AI tool mm -hmm. that enables them to prepare their own. So I'm just curious if you, you know, see you know, there are puts and takes there. What's kind of the net impact or how are you thinking about the potential net impact on those particular group of companies and types of companies which you know, we know are near and dear to private equity, um, yeah, any kind of take there? Yeah, I don't know. The word I thought of when you were saying that is disintermediation. You know, the notion that 
folks can suddenly gain access to these platforms and applications and start taking on these responsibilities on their own. But I think the wrinkle there is the associated risk, right? And I would argue a lot of companies don't want to take on that risk. So I would imagine that there's going to be a meeting of the mind somewhere in the middle. But to go back to kind of some of the things we were talking about, um, I think one of the biggest risks when you think about barriers to entry when it comes to what we're talking about in terms of AI, it, it's got to be a combination of data privacy, right, we, which we alluded to, and kind of some of the, the legal and ethical aspects to what is going on here. And so, for example, imagine a situation where a company says, all right, we're going to use AI to help us prepare you know, our, our corporate tax filing. And let's say for some reason there was an error. Well, who's going to be culpable for that error? Is it the person that chose the software? Is it how it was implemented? Is it how the software was actually working? Did you not have someone checking the filing before it was made? I think all those things are super important. And that's obviously just a hypothetical example, but you could see how there are a lot of potential pitfalls. And so I think a lot of companies, like I said before, see massive opportunity, but the path to realizing that opportunity, I think is going to have more pitfalls than people recognize at this point. Understood. Um, Joshua, one, one for you perhaps. Um, you know, are there any real world examples or any conversations you've had with um, you know, PEs where they have implemented artificial intelligence, be that in their own processes or be that as part of ongoing work with their portfolio companies? I would point to the um, summation and search of content. I think that's an area that uh, plays a large part in the intersection of what we do. Um, our clients have uh, certainly already built um, uh, ways to summate the, or you know, provide a summation of, of the content. And for them, it's really about you know, the information that they sit on, the data, being able to draw upon and get a, an answer to your question as quickly as possible. So this is an area where I think we're going to we'll continue to see more innovation, but it is definitely also an area where I think some large steps have already been made. Um, so I, th I think, th yeah, that, that certainly is one where I would say that um, this is something that we, we, we see quite a bit from our clients. And I said, I'll come to you with a, with a follow-up. It's you know, slightly different to the, the, the flavor of the questions that have gone before, but I know you have some thoughts here um, around, you know, at what size does um, a private equity fund, you know, potentially become uncompetitive or you know less competitive relative to public markets. Say, yeah, it's 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 an interesting question, and obviously a lot of debate uh, in the past around you know does private equity beat the returns of the public market. Uh, it, it, it's not surprising that smaller firms typically you would expect to have a you know, a larger gap and, and, a, and, a, and a high propensity to, to beat public uh, market returns. But uh, there's been a lot of research done on this topic, and I can't give you an answer for sure that, you know, it says exactly what that point is. Uh, and I don't think anyone can do that uh, in, a, in, a, in an easy way. But you do have to look at geographic variation, for, uh, certainly, and then also, um, you know, different sectors. I think. Uh, the work that Professor Falipu has done, for example, and um, I'm happy to share after this, uh, th this webinar the, the, his, his work, it's been very interesting. One of the big issues that he draws upon is that the IRR return calculations are fraught with a lot of, lot of issues. And one of them is, of course, the distributions when they come back because a private equity firm you know, deploys cash and gets the distributions back at different times. And what internal rate of return you assume in those IRR calculations with the distributions coming back is typically been uh, pegged to the internal rate of return that these uh, funds have, have had in the past. And so what you do is you create this cascade effect of an overinflated IRR number. Now if you take that out, we are talking about IRR numbers that are typically sort of in the 11 to 13 percent range, which basically matches what the uh, indices in the US have been generating. So you know, one can argue that over the last decade, the returns on private equity has been somewhat similar to the public markets. And of course, you have a very different risk adjusted return profile with private equity than you do with public equity. And so these are things that I, you know, I would say that the, the, the viewers of this webinar should really consider as part of the, the question being asked. 
But um, I, uh, I think it's a very, very fascinating topic and one that I will continue uh, certainly to watch myself. But um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's one to watch. Um, folks, I think we're, we're at time. Um, but just before we do wrap up, a quick thank you, Joshua, to you joining us remotely. And obviously, Scott and Harriet for, for joining me um, in person. And a, a quick reminder as well for all of our viewers, Thirdbridge provides the best suite of integrated primary research products on the market. If anybody watching wants to get in touch with our leading AI experts or read some of our industry-leading AI content, please do reach out and get in touch either to myself at daniel.thomas at thirdbridge.com or anybody from the organization, and we'd be happy to help. Um, with that said, Thanks again, all. Thanks again, Joshua. Um, thanks again for everyone who joined us.